OK, let's begin the general discussion. Number one, uh, we have a bad habit of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Let's look at the full context of this quote, page uh, end of 25 to beginning of 26. I repeat that these were not simple folk, not dulcet shepherds, noble savages, bland utopians. They were not less complex than us. The trouble is that we have a bad habit encouraged by pedants and sophisticates of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Only pain is intellectual, only evil, interesting. Uh, so the question is, do you agree that many people have this thinking? And uh, two groups took this question. And they both disagreed. They feel like happiness is something interesting. That is something that we can chase and that the chase is interesting. That if somebody does say that they are happy, it is interesting to think about why they're happy, what kind of happiness they have. Uh, so this story was written or published in 1973. And at the time in North America and many parts of the world, the thing that they were most worried about was nuclear war with the Soviet Union. They were worried that there might be a surprise attack and that nuclear war would destroy their entire country and that it, it's something that they themselves could not prevent and could not escape from. So perhaps when the author says that they can are we people often consider happiness to be stupid, perhaps she's talking about how in this world with so many problems with so many dangers. The idea that somebody could say that they are happy. It seems like either they're stupid or they're deliberately ignoring some of the world's problems. But when I talked to these two groups, uh, the answer that I heard was precisely because there are so many big problems in the world, whether it's uh, the war in Ukraine or the war in Palestine, or it's climate change, or it's the situation with China. All of these big problems are not something that individual people like me and you can solve. So if nothing we do really matters for this problem, then what's wrong with trying to chase our own individual happiness? Or, uh, putting those problems to one side and focusing on the things that make us happy. Maybe that's not stupid. Maybe that's the best way to get through life. Whether that is true will depend on how we look at the rest of the questions today. Question two. The people of Omalas know that they, like the child, are not free. How does this fact enable their happiness and prosperity? In other words, the story says that there is a cause-effect relationship between knowing about this suffering child and being able to be happy and successful. And this question is asking you to explain this cause-effect relationship. Why is one thing the cause? How does it lead to the effect? Uh, so like how does knowing about the suffering child let people become happy and successful? What is the logic behind this connection? So let's take a look at page 29. Uh, one group took this question, but they weren't able to give a complete answer. They were still thinking about it uh, by the end of the first period. OK. Here. Yet this is page 29 in the middle of the really long paragraph. Yet it is their tears and anger, the trying of their generosity and the acceptance of their helplessness, which are perhaps the true source of the splendor of their lives. 
Theirs is no vapid, irresponsible happiness. They know that they, like the child, are not free. They know compassion. It is the existence of the child and their knowledge of its existence that makes possible the nobility of their architecture, the poignancy of their music, the profundity of their science. It is because of the child that they are so gentle with children. So what is the logic we are given here? Something like they learn about this suffering child and people tell them that this is part of your society. You have to accept it if you want to continue living in this society. Like, uh, somebody says every good thing in this society is built on top of the suffering of this one little boy. So after learning this fact, the next time you go to enjoy yourself in the park, you'll think about the little boy. The next time you go see a movie, you'll think about the little boy. The next time you join in a city festival, one big party like the first half of this story, you'll always be thinking about that little boy who is not there at the party, who is not having fun. In fact, the next time you read this story from the beginning, every good thing you read, you will be thinking about the suffering of that little boy. Perhaps this would make people cherish the good things more. Perhaps when they know that it is possible, that it is guaranteed for at least one person to never feel this happiness. It will make you value your own happiness more. It will make you care about other people's happiness. So it says theirs is no vapid, irresponsible happiness. They know compassion. It is because of the child that they are so gentle with other children because they know that it is possible for somebody to lose all of this happiness. That's why they are not free. Free here, I guess, would mean something like you can do whatever you want. There will be no consequences. Uh, nothing bad will happen. But they know that it's possible for something bad to happen because it is already happening to one little boy. And so they're not free to do whatever they want. They are, in fact, encouraged by comparison to make the most of their life. The idea might be you can't help the little boy. You can't save the little boy. What you can do is try your best to make sure that you and everybody else can avoid that fate. And therefore, because people care about what happens, they care about each other. They are able to have a, uh, an incredibly happy and successful and prosperous life. But maybe it's not perfect happiness. If we go up a little bit. Oh no, oh, we'll leave that to a, to a later question. Question three, is it incredible for some people to walk away? So after learning about this situation, the author says there's one more thing to tell, and this is quite incredible. It's hard to believe. Uh, some people, after learning about the child, uh, let's read this, it's not too long. At times, one of the adolescent girls or boys who go to see the child does not go home to weep or rage, does not in fact go home at all. Sometimes also a man or woman much older falls silent for a day or two and then leaves home. These people go out into the street and walk down the street alone. They keep walking and walk straight out of the city of Omalas through the beautiful gates. They keep walking across the farmlands of Omalas. Each one goes alone, youth or girl, man or woman. 
Night falls. The traveler must pass down village streets between the houses with yellow lit windows and on out into the darkness of the fields. Each alone, they go west or north toward the mountains. They go on. They leave Omalas. They walk ahead into the darkness and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist. But they seem to know where they're going, the ones who walk away from Omalas. Is this situation really incredible? Is it really hard to believe that some people would leave what looks like the perfect society all because of one suffering little boy? Uh, two groups took this question. And I think their answers are very interesting. They at first they said they think that it's amazing, but they understand why some people would leave. Uh, but then I asked them to think if you were a citizen of Omalas, if you lived in this society and someone told you like a good friend told you, I can't take it, I'm going to leave. Would you find it more incredible? What if I told you we are living in Omalas right now? What if I told you that the life that we have, the happiness that we have, is dependent on the suffering of other people? Who makes your iPhones? Who makes your cheap clothing? Who takes care of the older people in society when their children are not there? If this society is dependent on the work and suffering of others, and one day a good friend comes to you and says, I've been thinking about it. I've been considering how the world economy works and how the world uh, society works, and I can't accept it. I'm going to move to Alaska. Would you find this hard to believe? Um, different people will have different answers, but I think the point here is to think about why it could feel hard to believe and why some people really do think that it is a good idea to try to leave this society. The story was published in 1973. At that time, there were more places you can escape to. Um, but in 2023, if you say you want to leave this society, it's very hard. Even the places you might think of as wild, out there, nobody living around you, they are also still part of the world society. Even if you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert, if you drive a truck, you are adding to global warming. So, you know, when I was choosing this story, this is also a question I was thinking about. Is it possible today for us to leave Omalas? Maybe that is the most incredible part of all, to believe that it is possible to reject this social contract and to live life a different way. Oh, by the way, if you don't know who makes your iPhones, uh, it's from various places all over the world, but one of the most important minerals is called cobalt. Uh, and it is mostly taken from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the middle of Africa, run by companies who illegally employ young children without protection from the uh, dangerous chemical cobalt. So your iPhones, your Samsung, my Samsung, are literally made from the suffering of young children.
Number four. If this is an essay, what do you think is its message and why? Actually, I think we'll talk about that later. I want to talk about number five first. If this is a story, how would you describe its world? Uh, two groups took this question. Uh, and we all agree that it's describing. What looks like the perfect world, every good thing you can think of, the author has added to this city. But at the same time, the author also gives us perhaps the worst possible situation you could imagine. A young innocent child who suffers and is mistreated for no justified reason. He didn't do anything wrong. He isn't born from a different class. He isn't from a different ethnic group. There is literally no reason this child is suffering. But the story connects the good and the bad. It is because there is this innocent suffering child that everyone else can be happy and successful. Uh, and one group made the very important observation that of the many different kinds of suffering, the author chose this kind. A young innocent boy with no reason to suffer. Being kept in a situation. That is the complete opposite of everybody else. In Omalas, you can lead a happy life. You can have friends, family, children, a good job. Uh, you can have like holidays, festivals, entertainment. You can take a completely harmless drug called Druze. There's free sex, anything you want. But for the child, he literally has nothing except his own life. He, do, he can't leave his room. He doesn't have light. He doesn't have cleanliness, health. The only thing he has is that he is alive. So it's not an abstract kind of suffering. It's a different way of thinking about human life. It's a different possibility. The young children suffering in the Congo and the young children in the primary schools of Taipei and Taiwan are all young children. They're all human beings. There is no reason why a, ch a child in Congo must suffer while a child in Taiwan does not have to. And I, according to this group, th that fact adds to the power of this uh, dark side of the society. It's an open possibility. Anybody might have the very, very small chance of being born as that little boy. And that is why the citizens of Omalas are changed by knowing about him. They know that it could very well be themselves. In English, we have a phrase there, but for the grace of God go I. If not because God favors me, otherwise I could have been that suffering person. Only it is only because of God that I am not that person. And if you don't believe in God, the idea is it's a random. Result. There is no real reason. Uh, and so. Um, if this is what is happening in this story, then it seems to be making us think about um, how much suffering are we willing to accept for our happiness. But if we go back to question four, if the point is not the story and the world, if the point is that the author is trying to tell us something, maybe we can find a different message. Let's took, take a look at uh, page 26. So we just said like only pain is intellectual, only evil interesting. But the author continues. This is the treason of the artists, a refusal to admit the banality of evil and the terrible boredom of pain. If you can't lick them, join them. 
this is an English phrase. It's more commonly uh, said as if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, if you can't win, you might as well join the other side. If it hurts, repeat it. But to praise despair is to condemn delight. To embrace violence is to lose hold of everything else. We have almost lost hold. We can no longer describe a happy man, nor make any celebration of joy. How can I tell you about the people of Omelas? They were not naive and happy children, though their children were in fact happy. They were mature, intelligent, passionate adults whose lives were not wretched. Oh, miracle, but I wish I could describe it better. I wish I could convince you. Omelas sounds in my words like a city in a fairy tale long ago and far away. Once upon a time. Perhaps it would be best if you imagined it as your own fancy bids. Fancy means imagination. Assuming it will rise to the occasion, for certainly I cannot suit you all. So yes, the story is telling about this society, but the author seems to be asking a different kind of question. She seems to be asking, how can I convince you that these people were truly happy? How can I convince you to believe in the perfect society? If you look at the near the bottom of page 27. Do you believe? Do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? No. Then let me describe one more thing. And then she tells us about the suffering young boy and on the near the bottom of page 29, she again asks us. Now, do you believe in them? Are they not more credible? She's asking us. Does adding this dark side. Make it easier to believe in this city to believe that this city is possible. And I don't know about you, but when I was reading the story for the first time and there were these long descriptions of how everybody was happy and celebrating and everything was perfect, I kept waiting for something to happen. I kept waiting for a secret to be revealed, for some situation to develop, for some danger to appear. And the author seems to know this. That's why she says. That's why only um, after. She thinks you don't believe, right? No. Only then does she add the dark side. So in fact, if we look at this as an essay, the author seems to be asking us, why is it so hard to believe that a whole city can be happy? Not that a whole city is happy, right? This is not a real city. It's not saying everybody in Chicago is happy, which is not true. It's saying it is possible for a city full of people to be happy. Why is it so hard for us to believe this? Uh, so uh, one group took this question. And I was talking with them about this, uh, and I gave another example. Think about falling in love. When at first you start dating someone, you feel like, you know, they're such a great person. But some part of you will also be thinking, this is too good to be true. There has to be some kind of dark side. Maybe they have a secret. Maybe they have a dark past. Maybe they're just pretending. But it's really hard to believe that I really did find the perfect person. But is it really that hard? Is it impossible to find somebody that you that really is good and perfect? 
if you think yes or if you think no, why? I think the author is asking a similar question, except it's not about one person and falling in love. It's about a city and the possibility of truly being happy. And because we only get the suffering young boy after we answer her no, it is hard to believe. We do not believe in such a happy city. Then in fact, we also have some blame, some guilt for creating this suffering young boy. Because it's our answer. It's we thinking to ourselves, you know, you're right. We don't believe this. Only then does the author create the suffering boy. So in, in, a, in a way of thinking, we are responsible for that suffering young boy. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because we don't believe in perfect, simple happiness, therefore that kind of happiness does not appear. But what if we can believe it? What if we are willing to consider the possibility that there could be a completely happy city? What if this is what the people who walk away from Omalas are thinking? It must be, right? Why would they leave Omalas if they don't imagine something better? Why would they leave a near perfect city to go somewhere worse. They must be thinking of somewhere with true happiness. And that's why the author says. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist. But for the people who leave Omalas, at least they're willing to try. Question six, how can you tell this was written in the late 20th century? Let's look at this part, page uh, one of the handout. I think uh, 1955, the fact that half of all US households now have a television is related to this story because it's asking a question of all the readers together. It's not asking each individual person. It's saying to everybody, why don't you believe in a city full of happiness? And if nobody believes it, maybe that makes it impossible. But if everybody believes it, maybe we can make it real. So it's not individual people, it's society. And the fact that most everybody in the US at the time was watching TV sort of created the idea of a common society. When everybody went home at around the same time to watch the same few TV programs, and the next day at school or at work, they talk about those programs together. That kind of creates society the idea of society, of living together with fellow citizens. Not complete, well, they are complete strangers. You don't know everybody, but even a stranger, you know that you are connected together by the society or the culture or the television. And only in that kind of situation does this story or essay make sense. It's not asking what do you personally think, it's asking, what are you, everybody, willing to try? Uh, and then, of course, the idea that some people suffer for the happiness of others is also present in books about race, uh, about how black people are treated unfairly, or how white people, especially when black people were still enslaved, how white people benefited from the suffering of black people. Um, and it's also related to the beat generation and the counterculture. These people who think that 
the idea of mainstream society is fake. It's not how many people live. Many people live on the edges of society, in between. And why do they live there? Is it because they reject mainstream society? Are these, in fact, the people who walk away from Omelas? Right, that's the idea of the counterculture. What the government says, what the media says, these are not good enough. We can do better. Uh, and then uh, I think there are a few more connections. Neoliberal capitalism, where everything follows market logic and individual competition and uh, precarious employment. If you think about it, this story also is uh, related to these ideas. All of the citizens are happy except for this one child. So every time a citizen it tries to enjoy something, tries to pursue their dream or their happiness or their success, they're always thinking in the back of their mind, at least I'm not that little boy. And as we said, they think this because they know it is a possibility. There's no reason for him to suffer. It's a random situation. So in fact, their happiness is precarious. Ling Wei They know that it's always possible to lose their happiness. Uh, and so when they try to enjoy themselves and when they try to chase their dreams and chase success, every single one of them is competing with the possibility of failure, the possibility of becoming like that young child. When the entire city's happiness depends on the suffering of that one child, what that means is that the entire city's happiness depends on every single person keeping that child in mind as they do their work or as they enjoy their life. So it is an individual competition where every individual is competing with the same person. Uh, and the story is also related to postmodernism. Postmodernism is where you don't get a straight story. You get parts of a story. You get images. You get references to popular culture. You get a playful situation. Uh, and the way that the author enters the story, if we think of it as a story and not an essay, the way that the author enters the story talks to the reader and seems to change the story depending on how we readers think. That is a classic postmodernist move. It's like she first gives us a section, right? The festival. And then she asks, do you believe this? No. What if I add something more? And then she gives us another section and she asks again, do you believe it now? Still no? Then let me give you the dark side. And then she adds the dark side and asks, now do you believe it? It's not a complete situation. The situation is built as you read. And you, in fact, join in building this situation, this story with the author by the way that you think about the story. That is very postmodernist. Yeah, I think those are the main ideas from the late 20th century that we can see in this story. Questions? OK, so next week we're reading five poems. By. By whom? Uh, Audrey Lord, we're reading the woman thing, black mother woman. And then from Mary Oliver, we're reading Wild Geese, Poppies, and then The Return. This poem is not in our textbook, but I think it's uh, important enough and good enough that we should read it. Okay, let me talk a little bit about these two poets. 
Audrey Lord is a black lesbian and she is most famous not for her poetry but for her essays and her political activism. She is one of the group of activists and scholars who tried to bring attention to the fact that uh, if you are disadvantaged in multiple ways, then you often will have a harder time in life than people who only have one disadvantage. So in her case, because she is a black lesbian, she had a harder time in life than black men. She had a harder time in life than black women. She had a harder time in life than white gay women. It's all three things put together that created the challenges in her life. And today we might think, oh, that makes sense. Uh, but when this movement uh, called intersectionality, when this movement first began, it began because the legal system did not recognize this. Uh, one of the famous cases that launched the movement was a story of some black women working at a car factory. Uh, and they sued the factory owner for treating them worse and paying them worse than their colleagues. And they said that it's because they were black women and the factory owner was abusing black women. They lost their case. And the reason they lost is because the court found that the factory owner did not mistreat women and did not mistreat black workers. Therefore, the factory owner did not break any laws like the factory owner did not treat all women worse than the men. They did not treat all black people worse than white people. So the factory owner did not break the law. So you can see the, the need for the idea that it's not just black people, it's not just women, but that black women are also uh, a, a class of people who might be treated unfairly. Um, so this was the great work of Audre Lorde's life. And she connected these ideas, right, of being a black woman, a gay woman, and also of uh, black women being mothers. Uh, and having to deal with the multiple challenges of motherhood while also being black. And even today, you know, this is the late 20th century, so the people we're now talking about are still very important in uh, the thinking of American culture. So even today, when something involving race happens on the news and people start saying, I want to learn more about this situation, Audre Lorde will be somebody that many others will recommend to read in order to understand. So we're going to read two of her poems. Uh, and that gives you a basic idea of what kind of things she might be writing about. Uh, her most famous quote is that we cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Uh, this is, of course, talking about um, the idea that black people are still suffering from the effects of slavery and how society still treats white people better than black people. And she's saying you cannot use the same tools, the same weapons, the same uh, thinking that white people used against us. You can't use that to improve your situation, to reform society. You have to find a different logic. You have to find a different way. You cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Now, I have paired Audre Lorde with Mary Oliver especially in these poems, because they are so different. Mary Oliver is a white Catholic woman. 
quite traditional woman. Uh, and her major work is poetry. But the poems I chose are also about motherhood, womanhood, nature, the environment, that kind of thing. So I think it would be interesting to look at these similar ideas in the poetry of two very different women. Um, Mary Oliver's best poems are, I have not chosen here, but her best poems are actually about poetry itself. How does poetry make us think in, and feel in different ways? How does poetry bring us comfort? How does poetry give us hope? If you're interested in learning about that, you can always look for uh, Mary Oliver's poems online. Most of them are very short. Um, actually, there's a really short one that I want to share with you, if I can find it. Oh, uh, that's not a good way to do this. Uh, here we go. Can you can you see this? Hang on. The uses of sorrow. In my sleep, I dreamed this poem. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. So that's the kind of poetry that Mary Oliver is most famous for. Um, but those are some of her later poems, and the textbook only has her earlier poems for some reason. So I added one, The Return. Now, I think you, I need to tell you a little bit about this poem because it has to do with ancient Greek mythology. Uh, here, the Minotaur. Ren mian sou sen. You know what I'm talking about, right? He's a man with a bull's head. Huh? Right. Uh, and the story of the Minotaur, let's see if I can remember this. It's not exactly American literature, so let's see if I can remember it. Um, so some dude pissed off the gods, as people do. Uh, and so they cursed his, uh, they cursed him to fall in love, uh, they cursed his wife to fall in love with a bull. And the wife got pregnant and gave birth to this minotaur, uh, who's a man with a bull's head. And his hus her husband was so ashamed, he's not willing to kill his wife's son, who was technically also his son. Um, so, Instead, he decided to hide his son in the middle of a maze so that the, his son would never meet anyone else, but he could still be kept alive. So he hired um, Didylus and his son Icarus to build the maze. And they built the maze, they put the Minotaur in the middle, and then the, the, the guy, the king, locked up Didylus and Icarus so that they could not tell others how to get through the maze. Uh, so Didylus and Icarus are stuck in this tower, and Didylus, because he's a great craftsman, he decides to build wings out of wax, to try to fly away, jump off the tower and fly away. And so he and his son build the wings, they jump, but as they fly, he tells his son, don't go too near the sun. If you go too near the sun, your wings will melt and you will fall. But his son doesn't listen. His son enjoys flying. He goes higher and higher. He gets too close to the sun. His wings melt off and he falls down into the river. But his father gets away. 
OK, later. Uh, there's a hero named Theseus. And in order to do something or other as part of his adventure, he has to go find the Minotaur and kill him. But of course, the Minotaur is in the middle of a maze. So when Theseus, he can find the Minotaur because the Minotaur is at the center of the maze. He can find the guy, he can kill the guy, but how will he get back out? Uh, so at this point, the king's daughter falls in love with Theseus and tells him, I'll help you get back out. I'll give you a ball of red string. And I will hold one end of the string. And as you go through the maze, you unroll this, uh, you unroll the string so that after you kill the Minotaur, you can just follow the string back out of the maze. And the woman's name, uh, the, the king's daughter's name was Ariadne. Uh, you might recognize this name. Have you seen Inception? The maze builder's name is Ariadne. Uh, and so that's the background for this poem, which is called The Return. OK, that's about it. Uh, read the five poems before next week. And then I think after that we have another short story and then the f that's it. Yeah. Cool. Semester is almost over. Good luck, guys. <laughs>